Are there days that you don't eat sometimes? Like the last time I was pregnant out here, I had to go out to UC Davis because I didn't get any prenatal care. I had to go out to UC Davis. As the number of Californians sleeping on our streets has increased over recent years, so has the number of street medicine programs to serve them. Welcome, my name is Brett Feldman. I'm the director of street medicine at USC, and this is the first of four videos brought to you by Invisible People and the California Healthcare Foundation, where you'll get to witness us go to the streets to deliver healthcare in the woods, under the bridges, behind the dumpsters, or wherever the people are. Our first location is Redding, California, which is our northernmost and also our most rural location. You'll see Dr. Patton and a community of neighbors experiencing homelessness go to the streets together to provide care and how Dr. Patton builds his practice with referrals from one tent to the next, of course, led by the people themselves. Let's go check it out. Hi guys. You know, the point in time estimates here are really low, but we've got maybe 600 unsheltered homeless and then probably 400 sheltered, not necessarily in like an emergency shelter, but in various like substance use programs and kind of transitional housing. So we're able to create a model that's a little bit different where we don't necessarily have to rely solely on street medicine. So we've got things like med respite, uh, mobile outreach vans, we've got a, a shelter-based clinic, and then we also do street outreach. Do you jump through all of those locations? You know, we have providers that are only on the van, providers that staff our shelter clinic, and then I'm kind of fluid throughout each one of those systems. I'm really the only provider currently that's doing any sort of street outreach, and then I'm also the medical director of Med Respite, and so that makes it easy because then I'm seeing patients on the street, I can do direct admissions into our Med Respite program, and then I also staff the van. I'm, I'm on the van every Wednesday. And so there's a lot of opportunities for me to kind of move across systems wherever my patients might be at, maintaining that continuity. I mean, I, I feel strongly that we do take ownership over everybody in our community, you know, and, and I sort of view our department, view Hope as the main provider of, of homeless healthcare services here. And so we've got to create a model that's actually going to meet the needs of our folks and, and not try to fit them into whatever box we've kind of ascribed to. But really it's me sort of thinking more broadly about that patient and, and saying, okay, I'm taking care of this wound, but at the same time, is this patient going to be able to heal this wound in their camp? Do we need to get them into med respite? Do we need to fund a motel stay so that we can really like address some of the root causes of why they've developed this specific medical issue? and we're trying to facilitate a long-term relationship with folks. And I, I think if you can do that successfully, then you can get patients to a point where they will come to see you, potentially, in, a, in, in other sites. This is Masonic Hill. This is a large encampment. So we'll just go talk to patients of mine and see what they need. And this hill goes down to a ravine, and they're like all along the hillside. What's up, man? Sorry to wake you. Morning. Hey! How's it going? But how long had it been since you've seen your doctor? It's at, been a while. Yeah, like a few years. Yeah, because the, when they she moved from here down there, it wasn't so easy for me to go see her. How long does it take you to get downtown? It was a good couple hours. A few walk. hours. But the bus take you right downtown, and you, it's hard to leave camp. So because everybody mm -hmm. wants to take everybody's stuff, and bus money. Uh, how would you get the bus money? Oh, can or a few hours. Yeah, if I'm steady can over a couple days, it's... I mean, it's kind of an all-day affair, really. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And it happened March 6th, so we're going on almost two months. Mm -hmm. you know, I went to the ER, and then they sent me home. And he set it all up pretty much for me to go to the respite house, and I'm really glad I did. And these guys are awesome. Oh, that's they actually awesome. have true compassion in their heart. They come out here, you know, once a week or every other week or so. Like, they, I didn't go back to the respite house when I went came to visit and he, you know, <laughs> looking for me. Um, she was getting a little bit antsy and so came back out here to her camp so she could be with her boyfriend and, and yeah. people. And, and we came out and found her and just, you know, continued to take care of that wound. Yeah. Kyle first started treating us last year when my boyfriend had a broken ankle and he brought him a walking boot. He's a, a wonderful doctor and what they do out here <laughs> oh, is amazing. Oh, he's super nice. What they do out here for, for the homeless is amazing. I have lupus, so it's kind of hard for me to, and I need to address all that so mm -hmm. I can get, get on some disability. Okay, and they, last time, Social Security said, you don't have enough, you haven't seen the doctor enough. Mm -hmm. That's really what I need to do. Yeah. Yeah, we, so. can work, we can work through some of that. So, 
Yeah, the first step would be I'll send Anna, my case manager, out to take you down to the disability office. So you can start that application and get your GA form. And then you and I just need to start meeting more regularly, doing some more deep dives with your health, and then All right. we can go through that process. All right, well, I'll... hang in there, okay? Yeah. What's that? Little Nate definitely needs to care. Like, you can hear him screaming, pain. Hey, he's first. He can take like, a lot of pain. Who is he? Oh, yeah, someone else was telling me about him. Where, Where's his I camp? Don't know. Just ask where the young Nate is. Okay. Just like All right, know. okay. We'll go see him. Right. Okay. We'll find him. Let's go find little Nate. I know. Let's go find little Nate. Hi, Audrey. How are you doing? Evidently, I did nothing but pee a stream last night. What's going on? I had a friend who stayed on that side and Raven in the middle like usual. I don't know how I didn't drown them. In urine? Uh-huh. So your whole, all of your bedding is, is, is soaked? Uh-huh. Yeah, I can talk to Paul and see if we can get things cleaned up. I would appreciate it so much. I have two blankets bagged and ready to go. I just don't have any money. I can't get to the laundromat. I have completely lost control of my bladder. And um, is there anything I can do about it at all? Herein lies the challenge. It's not uncommon for women your age to deal with some of these uh, issues of incontinence. Women can have stress incontinence, especially women that have had a lot of vaginal deliveries. Um, urge incontinence, which four is count. four does count. I mean, in my book, one counts for sure, right? But then at the same time, you can have like infections or you know different things. You know, certain medical conditions like diabetes could cause you to pee a lot. Well, so there's sort of a there's sort of a broad array of things that we could be dealing with here. I've been hypoglycemic for years, and I was beginning to wonder if maybe it flipped. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a glucose tolerance test in years and years. Yeah, I think I have my glucometer. So I think probably the first step, the first thing that we need to do is let me check your vitals. Okay. Let me check your, your sugar, your okay. glucose. <laughs> oh, okay. About Nate? Go, go see Nate. I'll, I'll still be here. You'll still be here. I'll still be here. Nate's I've been trying to get this kid. I'm going to drag him by his hair to the hospital. Well, let's take care of it right now. Yeah, Can I come back and see you later? Please do. Okay, because we got to talk about this. Don't forget me. Please go see Nate. Hey, back. Audrey. How could I? Yeah, so we, so we're out here in Masonic. We've had a couple of other patients that have uh, referred us. They were worried about a guy that's been camping out here. I've seen him once briefly, but don't necessarily have like a more of a long-term relationship with him. So like a month ago, I fell off my skateboard on the sidewalk and like I got staff on my leg. Okay. And then it went to my thigh and now it's on uh, my... The past like couple of weeks he's had a lot of uh, scrotal swelling and pus, and he's got a lot of genitourinary issues. And so I sent him up to the hospital after doing an exam because I was pretty concerned about uh, what he was presenting with. And then he was also somewhat hesitant to go to the hospital, although he agreed to do that. I offered kind of a wide range of transportation issues from calling an ambulance to having some of my HOPE staff take him up there. Ultimately, gave him some bus passes for him and his friend, and they're going to go up later today. The thing that that has really struck me out here, which is which happens in street medicine, but just seems so palpable here. And when you go down there and you're looking for somebody new, it's almost like instantly you can build this rapport with them. Yeah, our patients trust us, and, and that didn't come overnight for me. You know, when I came to this area, it took maybe a year, year and a half for me really like kind of proving myself and, and showing patients that we're going to be consistent in reaching out to them and providing care. And so there's a trust by proxy. Yeah, I think that's like a really good term for that. When you build rapport with folks out of camps, then they start referring people that need your help. And uh, we've got people out here with really significant medical issues that need hospital level care. And, and you know, we're able to come out here and triage that and, and get them where they need to go. There's a gentleman by the name of Ryan. He, he needs you. He okay. Okay, I've got his I've got his phone number. I'll call him. Please. Yeah, I end up doing just a lot of acute care. It's you know I try to do like chronic disease management and all that kind of thing, but most of the time it's like so and so just got out of the hospital and you got, got osteo and they've got this you know. So sometimes it's just you know as far as like planning your time, you sort of get caught in like yeah the severe. You got to get through the acute stuff to get to the... To get to the, yeah, yeah. and sometimes it's hard to do. 
Well, let me just take a look at your leg. Yeah. yeah. So Sarah's had some infections in her legs. She's got some like chronic venous ins insufficiency. Yeah, bad. Yeah. Right? We had her in a motel um, through our med respite program and uh, we're doing regular dressing changes. And I'm gonna put a good dressing on there that you can leave on for like probably two or three days. Okay. And then just do those dressing changes kind of at that frequency. How long have you been staying outside? Uh, off and on for about five years. I was a nurse for 14 years, yeah. I went and had a psych evaluation for myself and I found out that I'm bipolar and schizophrenic and um, I was able to get on social security and, and get my disability, but it was a struggle. And you know, right. I, I had a lot of help in, in getting my social security. That pathway is extremely, really, really difficult for, for a lot of people, so. How long did it take you to get it? Um, uh, almost three years. So we actually, um, just hired a psychiatric nurse practitioner that oh, works with our department. Yeah. Oh, okay. And she covers the van, but she also does like mobile visits and comes out to camps and does all that good stuff. Oh, cool. Well, if we're able to help you in this regards, we'd like to. So I'll talk with Tani and see if we can get you connected with, with a little more support and some of those resources. You know, I think one of the challenges that we have here in Reading and do have some resources, like we have a shelter, we have some robust medical services, but at the same time, like there's things that we don't have and there's some gaps in services, like we don't have a day resource center, there's no place that people can go and do laundry or have showers. You know, we lack a lot of the things that I think other areas kind of take for granted. How's it going? How many meals do you get a week? Um. I haven't had one of those in a while. When's the last time you ate? Oh, I had a sandwich yesterday morning. Are there days that you don't eat sometimes? Like the last time I was pregnant out here, I had to go out to UC Davis because I didn't get any prenatal care. I had to go out to UC Davis to get an emergency fetus removal a week away from being full term. Her being able to, to manage her prenatal care while she's out here underneath the bridge, like, like it's, that's really challenging and that's a, that's a really heavy ask for her. Um, and so us being able to connect with her and be able to lighten some of that load and then ultimately get her into a motel and a stable place to be for kind of, you know, the, the second half of her pregnancy yep. then allowed us, to, you know, she's in a stable place um, we're providing her with meals and a lot of case management support and so we're then yeah. able to like do some of that you know get her caught up in regards to a lot of her prenatal care you know we continue to follow Shannon throughout her entire pregnancy do you think you would have been able to go to prenatal care at all if Kyle didn't come out no I think it would have been like my emergency fetus removal honestly it's that's how that would have went down we carry a lot of food and blankets, sleeping bags, some tents, little sharps disposal containers. We hand out fentanyl test strips, uh, harm reduction kits, Narcan, dog food, condoms. Our Hope van, it, it goes to fixed sites. So it, it's a big RV type van uh, that's got two uh, fully stocked uh, exam rooms in the back. And so it's not necessarily one of those. It's not a, a, a vehicle where you can like zip around town seeing patients that need to be seen out at the camps. It's, you know, when they leave in the morning, they're driving to a fixed site and they're parking there for the full day. And then the patients have to come to them at, at those spots. The, the Hope fan, they, they care, period. And they don't miss a day to have that, that trailer set up for us. You are a blessing. How long have you lived here? I've been here 30 something years and I've been on the street since 01 when my mom died. I can't even explain what I've been through. When did you first apply for disability? I've been trying to get it for the last 20 years along with the ID and everything else that goes with it. I have two workers who are awesome. In two weeks that lady had me set up and she said, yeah. that's how we're going to do it. I'm going to do the paperwork and you are going to go to your appointments. We did it. We did it. You did it. She's been like denied like seven or eight times because her claims or her cases were always involving things like carpal tunnel, chronic musculoskeletal pain, this, uh, chronic hep C, and there was never like consistent documentation for her never. actually like 
describing her issues and and, and they challenges. They gave me an IQ level test, and it was yeah. lower than the kindergarten. See, so her advocate was actually um, able to get her over for some formal neuropsych testing, and then we were able to nail down that diagnosis of intellectual delay. And then, because of that, we were able to get her approved. And so she'll actually, she should be getting back pay to like to when she turned 18, and that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for Tammy. She's got really poorly controlled diabetes, and you know I've known about that as her, as her doctor for a little while now. But only till recently were we able to like actually get her on insulin. So, you know, by no means would I say that her diabetes is well controlled. But you know, there's like the gold standard of medical care. There's doing nothing, and then this is where we live. And and so, uh, I think the fact that she's doing something, I th I think, for her is a, is a real achievement evidence-based medicine, and that's mm -hmm. where we start. But then there's reality-based medicine. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you live in the, this is your reality, it does change the treatment. Yeah. The diagnosis of intellectual disability, mm -hmm. that her IQ is 50. Yeah. Um, but never diagnosed until this point in life. Yeah. And our whole system is, and I, I have a son with an intellectual disability, and I can tell you that it took all of my and current education yeah. to get that diagnosis and it has to be diagnosed in school mm -hmm. and in california you get assigned to a regional center and their whole point is to follow you through your whole lifetime so that you don't end up here yeah so if she were born to different parents then it might not have come to this and um you know data in, in california shows it's about 10 percent of uh, intellectual disability on the street, mm -hmm. but it's very undercounted because people aren't diagnosed. Yeah. And um, because it's such a hard diagnosis to get. And we have a friend, Mikel, that does this in Rotterdam and has mm -hmm. been testing everybody on the streets for intellectual disability. And it looks like it's about 30%. Wow. And that's yeah. significant because it changes the narrative from they won't do this and they won't do that to they actually can't. Yeah. That we're asking them to do things that they can't do. And then when you add an intellectual disability with other things like mental health diagnosis, mm -hmm. substance trauma. use, trauma, traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. all these things that are much higher, um, it, we're at, we might be asking too much. Yeah. Well, I think too, I think street medicine, I think is inspiring not only for our patients, I, I think it sends a message of hope to our patients, but I also think to just your average community member, I, I think it I think it sends a very positive message and it, I think it helps people because especially in regards to homelessness, I think people don't know where to start in in solving this as a, as a problem. And so I think street medicine gives an, uh, creates an opportunity for us to show them a way where we can actually do something concrete and we can actually make a difference. Our patients have dealt with so much loss and, and, and they haven't necessarily been given a, a fair shake and so I, I think we need to invest in these people. We need to invest our time, we need to invest our resources, we need to invest our care and our concern. And, and my experience is when we do that, like our patients will respond and, and they'll make positive changes in their lives. And um, you know, it may not be in the way that, that others want them to or, or expect them to, but I've seen them make positive changes and I've seen them really kind of you know, get somewhere where, where they've um, been able to have some stability in their lives. What a delight it was to watch the neighbors lead Dr. Patton to where he was needed the most within his community. And to watch Dr. Patton skillfully navigate a complex system to care for anything from pregnancy to diabetes on the street. That's real family medicine. Next, we'll go to Oakland, California to visit Lifelong Street Medicine and see how they use innovations and technology to deliver a crazy high level of medical care on the street. This video series is brought to you by California Healthcare Foundation. Visit chcf.org streetmedicine to watch all four videos and download our research.